Hallo, hallo. So, hello everybody, welcome, welcome to the stream. Uh, my name is Kilon Alios and I am uh, developing a game for Procedure Generation uh, uh, that's called Ephestos. Uh, I want to try to make it a mix between uh, No Man's Sky, Lead Dangerous, and uh, Ancient Greek Mythology. And we are still very in the very basic, in the beginnings of the project. Uh, I've been streaming this for a couple of months now. I started in the uh, first, uh, start of October. Uh, but uh, I, I surely start streaming uh, around 90 hours per month uh, on October and I have actually become pretty consistent for both months. Right now I'm clocking, by the end of December I'm clocking how many hours? Uh, 83 hours, where the previous month I clocked 85 hours, 85, almost 86 hours. So. 80 hours is more or less, you know, the average I'm doing. Uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, I didn't expect this to, to last that long, to tell you the truth, uh, because I have very short attention span and I, I, I tend to give up on things that uh, I get bored of doing at some point. But uh, streaming has been pretty fun. It uh, has been a pretty good experience so far. And I would like to... Uh, to thank everybody for the support. We are currently at 69 followers. That's a very symbolic number. Uh, and yeah, uh, around uh, uh, 490 uh, uh, subscribers on YouTube. I usually average around three viewers per stream, which is pretty good. Uh, I'm now an affiliate. And yeah, it has been two good months. Uh, I didn't expect uh, to take streaming so seriously. But uh, it has been very helpful for me to keep focus on my project and it has been very helpful to, for me to keep pushing and keep learning things. 
And I hope that I will keep at it for the next year. And hopefully if things go well for many years to come. Uh, that's my hope. Uh, of course, you know, uh, practice is always very different than theory. So, where are we at right now? And I think this is also a good opportunity for me to talk about, uh, you know, this project and, uh, you know, what I want to go with it. Uh, right now, uh, this is supposed to be a large-scale project. I was thinking about this and I realized that I because of the scale of project, it will be not that wise to focus only on one area. Uh, currently, I have focused almost solely on the terrain generation uh, because uh, planetary exploration is, of course, a big part of Elite Dangerous and a big part of uh, No Man's Sky, and it's definitely a gameplay loop that I also enjoy a lot when I play games. Uh, so, obviously, having uh, procedural terrain, having procedural planets and solar systems uh, is very important. I don't think I will be going for something realistic though. Uh, the, the scale of the planets, as I said in the previous stream, probably will be a lot smaller, will be like a, a thousand times smaller. Uh, so right now, my goals for the next year will be to come up with at least some form of demo. Uh, that will be very simple, very rudimentary. Um, and we'll have uh, at least a planetary exploration. Uh, some space navigation, maybe, uh, some typical and very simple enemies. And yeah, it will be just a prototype. Uh, obviously, I don't expect to do a lot of things because uh, I, I have been working on stream for the, the last two months, uh, practically full time. And I haven't done much because, you know, I have done, I mean, I have done some things. I've done uh, Ray Martin, uh, I meant my first. Render engine. I never expected that I would be creating my own render engine, but I've made a very extremely simple uh, render engine, a few hundred lines of code uh, for ray marching. And of course, now I, I double with uh, uh, marching cubes, which is a, a really good algorithm for uh, procedural terrain generation. And I've, I've worked with, you know, with shaders, and uh, you know, I, I went back to C after almost 20 years. Um, and now I am integrating Python into Godot. Uh, and what else? I have made my own code of module uh, that acts as an engine. Uh, make my own kind of uh, API. I'm now uh, on the process of making my own scripting API. So uh, for two months, uh, I say that you know we did some uh, things, but you know none of those things are something that can easily show to people uh, because they're mostly mostly codey stuff, and I don't want to get stuck in code forever. Uh, I know that you know it's the scale of the project that that will force me to write a lot of code and I will have to do a lot of things. But a game is not just code, it's also assets. So I would like also to switch the stream a bit on uh, making assets for the game. Uh, I already made a, a simple starship, uh, which you can see here uh, in a previous stream. So I would like to do more uh, modeling streams because I want to brush up also my skills when it comes to Blender. I haven't touched Blender for quite some time, at least regularly. Uh, so I have, there is a scene here, uh, this scene, and yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a simple spaceship, nothing uh, too original, and yeah, there's no navigation. I also ha I would like to go back and fix the, uh, why does it close? What happened? Uh, probably it's the player. Yeah, it's a player. There's an error. So yeah, that's basically what I want to fix. I want to fix the code here uh, because this script was written for uh, Godot 3. Another thing I did uh, these two months is that I moved to Godot 4, which I didn't expect to do, to tell you the truth. But Godot 4 has been pretty stable so far. So yeah, and this is the kind of spaceship I have here. Pretty simple spaceship, nothing, you know, nothing too impressive. And I decided to I also make a decision on the look that I want for the game. I want to make something that's uh, pretty low poly, maybe a bit higher poly than this. Uh, but yeah, I would definitely would like something that's pretty low poly because it's really easy to make models like this. I don't have to spend too much time. And because of the scale of the project, will be it's not really going to be very manageable to um, to make something that's highly detailed and realistic like uh, Elite Dangerous. Or even No Man's Sky, right? No Man's Sky is pretty, you know, high resolution graphics uses. 
uh, which is great because they have artist teams and all this kind of stuff. But I, I, I'm just by myself, so there's no way that I can create. Uh, that, uh, even from a, from a skill point of view, but also from a time point of view, right? Because I want this game eventually to be released. I don't mind if it releases in six or seven or eight years, but I want, I want it to be released. I don't want it to be stuck forever uh, in the development cycle. Uh, at least I want to be released as an early access. You know, that's the minimum I have. So I want, if it's possible, in three years to release as an early access, and if it's not possible, at least the maximum amount of six years to release as an early access. Uh, so yeah, I'm pretty happy with this. I mean, this is pretty much a very crude model, obviously, but I do like this kind of look, and I probably will go for something like that. Obviously, it's going to be more stylized and more, you know, a bit more detailed than this. So yeah, uh, that's the plan for uh, this year. It will be to focus, of course, on terrain generation, and. From there on, I would like to do uh, terrain generation, some basic uh, space uh, flight simulation, um, and uh, enemies, you know, uh, basic missions, some star bases and starships maybe in this year, uh, like this one to be able to navigate and, you know, you also go be able to go inside and, you know, sit on the camp test chair and all this kind of stuff, uh, which uh, you kind of kind of do in... Uh, in Noma Sky, uh, this is something that Noma Sky doesn't really have. But well, you can do with freight, freighters. Uh, I would like to have like a, a full model inside here that you can navigate and you know you can upgrade and all this kind of stuff. So yeah, that's about it. So this, the goal for this stream is not to. I will not. I will not do any modeling right now. I will go back and trying to uh, refactor the code uh, because I was thinking about it. And I realized myself, in the end, I'm going to refactor the code because I want to make the code that's... If I use more cubes, I want to make... I don't like the way that the, the code is structured right now because I haven't really written the code. It's not really my style of coding. So I told myself, why not refactor the entire code? It's not that difficult anyway. It's not that complex. And do it through unit testing because I also wanted to test the unit test framework in Python and test the Python integration. So why not both, both refactor and at the same time unit test to make sure that everything works fine with Python. So yeah, I'm gonna be doing that today uh, in this stream. So let's get to it. So we'll start by... Uh, I will start by... Uh, creating the Kai Marching Kai Voxel class. Now, that is also a dilemma I have. Should I name things uh, with Kai in front of them? Or should I just use the name Spatial Python? Because it doesn't really matter in the end of the day. Now, this is a problem with JScript because JScript, I don't think JScript has namespace. Uh, it doesn't have the concept of modules like Python has, if I remember correctly. Maybe it has. Well, maybe in, in terms of scenes, it has that. Uh, but if, because I'm going to use Python, I probably will go for something that doesn't use this kind of naming convention. Uh, yeah. So let's name this a voxel class instead. So what I'm going to do is open my beloved editor, code editor, and so I have started here to deport the code. This code we have to change. Not tremendously though, but it has to change. So what I'm going to do is go here in the Kai Martin cubes in the header file and instead actually I think I will make a new header file that I'm going to call a voxel. Voxel 8. Uh, the, the problem is 
that the fact that is that uh, C++ has a global name scope. So, well, no, you actually direct from, uh, I don't know, should I name things Kai for the world? Uh, well, it's only two letters, so yeah, okay, let's name it Kai Voxel. Okay, let's name it Kai Voxel. Just to be on the safe side, because I don't want to have any conflicts of names in C, C++. Okay, so a new file that I'm gonna name uh, Kai Voxel. And this is gonna be a Voxel definition. Uh, it's gonna be a header file for starts. Okay, so we're gonna need a, a guard. So a guard can be found here. So this is a guard, okay. Uh, okay, let's do that. Kai voxel. And this is going to define a voxel. On the other hand, the big question is, should this be defined in C++? I think it should be defined in C++ and not in Cython. I think it should be defined in C++, yeah. So we have class, uh, it's gonna be named Kai Voxel. And is it inherited from somewhere? Hmm. I could make it inherit from... I guess I could make it inherit from... Uh, let me think how it heard from. Uh, let's inherit from... Where is the header file? Okay. Uh, let's make it inherit from object, which is basically uh, an object for... Yeah, I think... I'm... Let's make it inherit from object. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So... Wait, what? No, that's that's gonna be right. No, I, I missed the, the the column. What? What happened? Okay, uh, but I have to also include uh, class DB an object for this to work. Okay. And let's do an end if as well. Okay. So, what's the problem here? Ah, okay. Okay. So, why complaints here? Maybe complaints because I don't define anything. So this one is gonna have some public stuff, right? Uh, okay, let's take a look at this. Uh, protected is this one, okay. And then we have public. So the first public goes is, of course, uh, the constructor itself. Okay, and it's constructor, I don't think constructor returns anything. I think it's defined without a return, yeah. So from here, we're gonna have... So the first thing you're gonna have from here is gonna be the variables. So it's gonna be the vertices. And how the vertices are defined. So I think if I'm reading it correctly, the vertices are defined as... How the hell did I define them there? So we need something that's gonna be vertices. We need one that's gonna be uh, distance values. And we need also to be uh, the polygonize function, which is gonna be a messer now. 
So this is going to be the Mesa, which is basically going to be the polygonized function. So I'm going to be changing the code quite dramatically. It's, not going, to be, it's, going, to, it's going to be a very different design from the ones we had. Um, so the big question is how the hell I'm doing this? Uh, how do I make an array of vertices? Uh, let's see how I did it last time. So if I remember correctly, how I defined, I think this is what it is. Yeah, uh, vector, vector three. So I think that is what I need. Br uh, yeah, ah, of course, there's also the indices. Yeah, absolutely. So how are we gonna do this? Um, So, okay, so I need to also create another one that's going to be a class uh, KIMES and it's also going to be public object. I don't know if I'm going to put this one here, probably not. Uh, and we're going to have the GD class. And it's gonna be no, it's not like Cyclops. This one, this one is Sky Voxel. So basically, what I'm doing here is I'm exposing this also to GDescript. So the Script API will be creating probably will be also accessible from GDescript. And it's not gonna be exclusive to Python. Uh, there is little reason for me to make it exclusive to Python anyway. Uh, Kai mess. So this is gonna describe a mess uh, object, of course, yes. And it's gonna have uh, protected, and of course the binding methods here: static, uh, static, void, uh, bind methods. I'm typing it manually because I want to get used to also the name, so I memorize them every time. I don't have to copy paste themes every single time, so I know what I'm doing. Public, and this one's gonna have. That's typical things like, uh, um, is it vector? I think it was vector three. Um, vertices. And is that the case? This is how we did it. Yeah. So the one thing I need to make sure is that I also include the vector here. So it knows exactly what to do. Okay, so we have vector vector three, and then we have vector uh, vector three again. It's going to be the normals, of course, and then vector. No, actually, no, that's not a vector. That is going to be what was that? It was a vector int. I still is a vector. Huh? Vector int. Hmm, I'm not sure about this. Vector int uh, indices. I see if that's gonna work. I'm not certain if that's gonna work. Uh, we also need the constructor here, so it's gonna be kindness. Yeah. Uh, so this is gonna define the mess, and this is gonna define the voxel. But the voxel is gonna have a mess instance as well included. So that's going to be Kai um, mess mess. That's the logical conclusion here. Yeah. I don't think I need anything else. Uh, maybe width and height. Also maybe a good idea. So int width. Uh, int height. But although it shouldn't be an int, it should be a float actually. 
load and maybe position as well. However, the position cannot be a float, it has to be a vector 3 actually. So the vertices are the, here is going to be the same setup. So the vertices of uh, the voxel is not the vertices of the mesh of the voxel, they are actually only the boundaries. The, vector, the vertices of the boundaries of the voxel in essence. Uh, and this is distance value, so that's going to be also vector. I don't know. Uh, actually, this is not a vertices. Wait. I don't know. Is this that how it works? Uh, distance values are just floats. I don't know if this is how it works exactly. I'm not quite certain that the format is correct here. So this is the weight, the height, the position of the voxel, the vertices, the distance values, and the mess. The messer, which generates the mess itself. So the messer is going to generate a mess. Well... Yeah, I'm not going to be... Uh, so this one tells us how many vertices... No, I think... I think... We see how we're going to work because the, the, the logic says that if we generate the mesh, it should stored into the mesh variable here, uh, which probably will be the standard behavior anyway, but probably will make it optional so you don't have to overwrite the mesh value if you want to generate a new mesh. Let's say you want to generate a new mesh that you don't want to overwrite the existing mesh and you just want to make a new instance out of that. Yeah. So that's how I see this happening. Okay. So what I'm going to do Okay, so Uh, okay. Let's take a look how it uses that. See if I'm using correctly here. Okay, so I think I do. Yeah, new vertices. Yeah, I think I use it correctly. Yeah, I think I use correctly. Mesh points. Yeah, I think I used correctly here. Okay. How about vector uh, float? Is there a float? Yes, 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 yes. So. Okay. 
And there's supposed to be constructor here. Okay, let's take a look at the definition. It's pretty useful, this one, yeah. Iterator, no, it's iterator. So where's the, is it push, where's the push path exactly? I think it's part of the vector 3. Yeah, it should be part of the vector 3. Yeah. Take a look at this. Let's take a look at this. This is the iterator. An array. Oh, okay, push back. Oh, here it is. Push back. There's no push front. I don't think there's a push front. There's only a push back. Hmm. There is no append. There is an insert though, but the insert is, means to go to a specific place. So the insert is the position. Here's the position, then the value. So we call by index. We have a size, clear, pointer. Uh, what exactly is the pointer? A pointer retains of what? A pointer. So this is then a pointer, basically. Yeah, this one retains a pointer. Where the pointer, this one returns a constant pointer. Right. So this one is public. Okay, so we can access this one. Push back. A pen. Ah, okay, there is an a pen here. So there is an up. Okay, so it's basically uses the pushback a function. It's the same thing. Okay, okay. It's a good to know. It's a good to know. So basically, this is primi a primitive type that is used for vector three, vector twos, but I see also it's used for floats as well, which makes sense because it's an array of floats. But the problem, however, is I don't really know how it knows whether it's monodimensional or three-dimensional. I guess it knows by the type itself. It's a vector two. It should be, yeah, where, where actually the vector 3 is redefined? Uh, vector 3. So this is the vector 8. What is the vector 3? Vector 3. So let's take a look at this. Vector 3 is defined on vector 3 8. Okay. Right, so it's a different, it's a struct, where the other one was, uh, okay, let's put them together. So the vector three is a struct, but the vector eight is a class. Interesting, interesting. Uh, so this one is a class, or this one is a struct. Oh, I see. So it's one unit, but it has ah, it has an X, Y, Z. That's why. Okay, so it works exactly the same way as a as a standard vector. It just it has all. It's basically struct, and it has X, Y, and Z. Ah, okay. So I, I think I understand why it defines a struct because it, it it's supposed to be like a primitive type. Yeah. Although here the way they do it is almost the same. So this one is a vector three. Okay, 
So what I have here right now is the vertices, which of course they have to be vector three because it's X, Y, Z, the position of every vertex. And then I have the uh, values. Those are only single values, one value per vertex, and it's just the distance of the vertex of the voxel to the uh, three geometry defined. And then we have the mesh, which has a typical vector two and vector three. Vector two is only the UV coordinates. Vector three is the normals and the vertices again. And then we have the indices, which is an int. But the vector is also, well, a vector is an array basically. So yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, I see what you did there. I'm trying to understand that I'm using, I think I'm using the correct. Uh, the correct data here. I don't, I don't, I don't think I'm doing anything wrong here. A floats, that's correct. It's a floats. The mess for the mess. And this one it represents only a single voxel. Now, what I need to do now is, of course, define the C side of this. Uh... This one is vector three, correct? Uh, yeah, I don't think I think anything wrong there. I think I do things correctly there. The only problem I have is this one. Why this one is a problem? Okay, so we have now to go. Let's close that. We have to go now. And let's close everything that I don't gonna be using directly right now. So this one now is shouldn't get things uh, vector three. Do I need the vector three stuff? Yeah, probably yeah. So instead of Kai matching queues, I will actually now uh, import the Kai. Uh, voxel and it's not gonna be a struct anymore now it's gonna be the classes so the big question is how to define those classes I think uh, it's uh, how else are we doing that? okay here it is CVP class okay so we have CVP class instead uh, which is gonna be of course the Kai mess And CP class uh, is going to be the Kai Voxel. So that should do the trick. Uh, let's remove all the other stuff. I'm going to remove everything. Yeah, I'm going to have to. I will, I will remove everything. Yeah. Because it's going to be very different now. So let's remove that. Kai vector 3. Now that I don't. Why make a class vector Kai vector 3? Oh, I, can, I try to define my own vector 3 class and have it have data. Hmm. Hmm. I don't think I need a vector 3, though, because I could use just a, a tuple. I, I think I will. I, I actually know. Uh, I don't want to do that. Let's remove all this. Let's remove all this, yeah. And let's move those actually with this as well because I don't need that anymore. Uh, remove the polygonize as well. I don't need that anymore. And let me also go here and remove all this nonsense because I know now that everything works correctly. I don't need that as well either. So let's remove that as well. So how are we going to do this? So that imports the classes. Um, 
We now need to clear the attribution methods for using Python with the declaration in a file. So let's add the declaration. Okay. So the way I, th I think about this is that I, they have to defend first of all as on the C side, and they have to be de defined on the C, uh, on the Python side. So what we have here is going to be the definition of those classes. And yeah. Okay, so let's start with the mess. So the mess has a vector, a vector three. Now the problem here is, uh, well, if it's vector three, I don't think we need to uh, vector three. Okay, so I put it here. Uh, but I probably will need also. To import the class as well of vector, right? The, uh, the template class. So vector vector three is the, of course, the vertices. Uh, then there is a vector vector three again. So basically, the bracket here is how it defines templates. Uh, we have the normals, and then we have a vector uh, int. Uh, which is the indices. So that is the chi mess. I don't think I have a function for that. And then we have the voxel, which the voxel, of course, has. Uh, what he has? He has a vector, vector three which is the position it has a vector vector 3 which is its um, uh, its uh, distance values and it has also an int uh, not an int uh, a float for width Load for height, uh, and although I don't, I, those, well, this is one thing I don't understand about Cython is why the hell I tell it to get things from the header file and then I have to redefine them. I guess you have to redefine them if you want to basically make, expose them to Cython itself, which I don't know if I, I need to. But anyway, we're going to do it right now, just with the manually. So then we have int uh, measure, which right now it's an empty function, so I don't need to do anything specifically for that. Uh, what else we, I forgot? Uh, and of course the mess, yeah, of course the mess. So we need the mess as well. So the mess is going to be chi mess. Uh, the one thing I have problem here is that is this going to be a conflict between the way that I name things on C++ and the way that it names things on the Python side, on the Cython side? Can I use the same? Okay, let's take a look how he does it here. So, is he using different names? He doesn't. He uses exactly the same name. So, there's no conflict there. Probably because he uses, it adds things to the name. Yeah. Okay, so one thing I didn't add is the exception. So this one is probably for raising an exception on Python if I do something stupid, which is not a bad idea. Uh, I don't need to, I don't, I don't think I need to change the names here, no. Which is good. Uh, KMS mess is here. So that's about it. So. The next stage is, of course,
Why will I need to include the C++ code though? Right, this is only needs the header information. Created by X file named RectBX to build our wrapper. Uh, we are using a name other than rectangle, re rectangle. But how use a name other than rectangle? This is the name you have. Rectangle here and rectangle here. How you use a different name? Maybe it means for that, for rec area, or for rec pointer. I don't see any other name here. It's a Python has a single module uh, level namespace for both Python and C names. This can be inconvenient if you want to wrap some uh, external C functions, provide the, uh, the Python user with the Python functions of the same names. Okay, so basically what it says here is the conflict is between Python and C. So we have here uh, a void as a function. Uh, then you can see more rapid in packs as follows. Seedject tomato. Okay, so there is a gauntlet when I define. Uh, okay, okay. But. So there might be a conflict between Python and C, but there's no conflict between C and C the way that they import things. That's how I understand this. So if I go here and I have imported from, uh, from the header file those two classes with the same name, there's not going to be a conflict, but if I try to define a new class with the same name, then it's going to be a conflict. Well, how this is possible is a good question. That's what it says here. So wait a second. Does it, has it defined any uh, Python class here? No. No, it has defined a main function. Uh, I want to see how it defines, however... Right, a class. Here we go. I buy right angle. Okay. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, I think this one is in a different definition by a, 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 I think it's called by by D, which for definitions. Uh, but it doesn't say anything here about a pi D. Mm. So wait, what, what, what is this one is important? It doesn't import a header file because it will specify a header file. So wait a second. So we here we import, oh yeah, here it is, uh, P PXD, okay. So it's a, PX, it's a PXD for the definitions. I think PXD files are uh, basically the equivalent of header files for Cython. Um, so, okay, let's do it like that then. So I'm gonna save this as file save as uh, PA, PXD PXD uh, So this one's going to be a definition file And 
uh, I don't. The password is not needed here. Uh, I don't know about the vector three here. Uh, this is gonna work. I'm not sure about that. But I think with structs you don't have to define everything. So this is the uh, P. So. Uh, yeah, so we're gonna need a new uh, file then, save us, uh, it's gonna be pyx, and here we have the implementation of those classes in Python. Uh, oh, actually, it already exists, so, okay, so let's go here in the pyx, remove that, and instead we're gonna do what he did here, so what we're gonna do is say from uh, blah blah import this okay so here we're gonna say from uh, c kicklops c kicklops uh, right actually it's uh, with not capital c kicklops uh, import uh, uh, Kai mess and from Siki Clubs uh, C import uh, Kai Voxel. So this will uh, import the definitions, and then we're gonna go and make a Python class, class uh, mess instead. I don't need to put the Kai in front of it because it's going to take the namespace of the module anyway. So that should actually make it inside. It's going to be making basically a module is going to call it Kicklops. And inside there it's going to put a mess. So it's not going to conflict with anything else inside Python. So we don't have to put a Kai in front of it, which makes things a bit cleaner. And there's a less likely chance that someone is going to make a mistake. Unless, of course, they do from import everything, which is basically collapses the namespace. Uh, if you know Python, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, which basically, because generally, when you import a module and you want to use a method from that module, you have to put the name of the module, use the dot, and then put the, the name of the class you want to use, and then use the name of the method. Um, so it works very similar to how you have access to methods from a JavaScript, right? You use the, the name of the class or the instance, and then the name of the method dot and the name of the method. But here we have modules. Modules in, ob in Python are also objects. So you access them very severely. So that basically eliminates the problem with, uh, with name conflict, which is why, however, uh, in C++ you can have also namespaces uh, using uh, namespaces. Uh, so I could have used a namespace here instead of using Kai, but it's okay, it's fine. I'm, I, I like this idea because I think ZDescript doesn't have namespaces. I'm not I'm mistaken. I don't think ZDescript has a namespaces. Does it have namespaces? ZDescript namespaces. Does it have namespaces? Uh, okay, let's see what the Reddit says. Put the namespace part of the function name, simple and effective. No. That's not what we want. Uh, okay, so there is a feature here. Okay, so you can have, well, you could have a namespace like that, yeah. You can have a class that references other classes. Yeah, you could have that. And use the, that class as a container for the other classes and use that basically as a virtual module, in essence, in the script. Yeah, you could do the same thing, but it's not something that a language offers out of the box. Right? Because if I go and say, make an instance of that class, the logic dictates, well, can I make an instance of that class? How am I going to obtain the name? No, I, can, I have to use class names. But the problem with class names is that they are global. They don't have any form of scope, as far as I know. They are global names. Which is the whole point where namespace exists in the, in the end of the day. Namespace exists because they avoid the use of global. Global, basically, is a one level of namespace, right? Namespaces are nothing more than things that contain other things, right? 
So you can have a module. If you, you can have a module in Python that's called file, and that module contains another module. That uh, usually, when we have a module contains another module called the parent module, a package. So you have one module that contains another module. That's a module that's called file contains another module called PDF. And inside that PDF module, you have all the PDF classes. So you can have PDF reader or PDF writer. And the PDF reader can read from a PDF and do several stuff. And PDF writer class can read from a, a PDF uh, and, uh, and actually write to a PDF. Uh, you cannot really do that with GDescript. Uh, if you name your class, because generally uh, classes don't have names in GDescript, which is even worse, uh, you have to use the class name. And then you're going to refer to it directly with the class name. You, you, you cannot go through modules. And that is dangerous because uh, that means that the class name itself is a global variable, which means that you have the same problems you're going to have using global variables in general, which consider a really bad uh, coding practice because you can have easily known conflicts. If you make a mistake and, uh, and name one class of yours mess, that can class can easily uh, collide with the, the internal class inside Godot that's also called a mess. In Python, you cannot really do that because anything you define is defined inside the scope of a module. So, uh, if uh, Python had a, a core class that's called mesh, probably would be inside an existing module, like a uh, you know, geometry module. So, it wouldn't be possible for you to conflict your name of your class, even though it's the same name, with the name of the, the class that Python had. So, this is why namespaces are very useful and they are used in many programming languages. Unfortunately, I think JavaScript doesn't have that, which is kind of a huge deal. And on another reason why I'm using Python instead of JavaScript, right? Uh, you can go around that by having a class referring to another class, but it's still the name of your class team remains a global. It's just you use a trick to emulate the behavior of namespaces. But the namespace doesn't just give you access through something else. It really hides and erases uh, a name from the global space. So there is no potential conflict because you're still going to have a conflict. Right? If you have a mess and then you have another mess, even if they, uh, they are a reference inside another class that you use as a module or as a namespace, you, you, they're still going to conflict because they all live in the global space. So the big question here is, did script does offer something? No, I don't think this script offers names, uh, namespaces. Yeah, exactly. So as you can, just cannot guarantee, it's not going to conflict with the other plugins using the class name. Other than using aggressive prefixes or not using class name at all in plugins. But even if you don't use class name in the plugins, well, yeah, because you don't have uh, a name there in your class. But there's some, maybe some way that JavaScript names the classes anyway, right? So I think that what happens is probably JavaScript gives us unique names that you don't have access to. So the only way to reference an instance then, you have to go through the node system and say, okay, is that gnome? Find the child of that gnome. Or maybe, uh, I think gnomes can also have names. So you can have names. But I don't know if the naming there, the node name is uh, unique. Can Is it always unique? Because people say, okay, don't use class name, which is fine. But then how actually I, how I can easily reference another instance from its name? How I can easily identify? Because that's the whole point of a name, right? You can easily find something knowing the name. You don't have to. You don't have to keep a reference on it, because you may not know even if it exists. I don't know if that class has an instance. Maybe it has an instance yet. I don't know even where in memory the class really is. Having a name is a convenient way for me to just get a reference to the class itself very quickly. So not using the class names itself doesn't give you an advantage. It basically makes things worse for you because now you have you're no longer able to reference a class. Uh, you can use prefixes, which is basically what I'm doing here. A prefix basically is what I'm doing here with Kai Vox, where I put the Kai in front of it. So that reduces the chance of having a name conflict. But you still can have a name conflict. Someone else can also name their class as Kai Vox, or Kai Vox, or whatever you want to call it. So there is the dangers of not having a namespace. And unfortunately, this script really does that. So 
So yeah, TeamScript really desperately needs a module system. Uh, I have worked only one time again with a language that didn't have a namespace, but what they did in that programming language called Faro, uh, they, they didn't use namespaces, but they didn't allow you to name a class with the same name as another class. So because the language was also an ID, every time you create a new class, it was performing a check to make sure that you don't use, uh, you're, trying to, you're not trying to use a class that already exists as a name. And even if you're trying to import, even if you try to, uh, you know, go backdoor in essence in the system, so basically import the code uh, from a JIT repository or something else, and happens to also have the name, the ID will refuse uh, to import the class and tell you whether you like to rename the new class or whether you want to rename the old class. And frankly, it wasn't a good idea. Because, yeah, renaming things, uh, as you know, is refactoring, and refactoring can be a pain. So it's not a good idea to rename things. Uh, and I realized there, because I already knew Python and how extremely important modules are. And as a matter of fact, it was one of the heated discussions in the remaining list, how to implement a module, an efficient module system uh, in their programming language. And I was all, once one of the proponents. I don't think they actually implemented it in the end uh, because it's, it's not easy to do. You have to change the language, you have to change the syntax and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so I don't think they did something like that. They had some workarounds, though. Yeah. No, no, he actually tries to say the same things I was saying, that you make a class and you make that class uh, uh, reference other classes. You could do that, but that's not true. Really. It's not as elegant solution. It's a pretty ugly solution. Yeah. Uh... So, okay, what happens with this discussion? Mm, a new proposal. Actually, I'm very interested to see what happened there. Did Godot give up on namespaces? Uh, just plugins. Yeah, here it is. Here it is. If you use a custom class named util when creating a plugin, there is absolutely no guarantee that the user is not using a custom type with the same name. That's that's basically what you call a name conflict. It's the reason why you should be using global variables in general. However, one thing to understand here is that. Even though class name defines a global name, class names by themselves are not a bad idea. Having names for your classes is very important and a must-have in a programming language. Uh, it's the fact that it keeps the names globally and it doesn't have a namespace scope that makes a class name basically an incomplete implementation. So because many people say, okay, class, using class names is really bad, it is bad. But it's not because class name is a bad idea. It's a good idea, but it's an incomplete idea, which makes that it makes it easy for you to do. Uh, because if you name some things and a programming a language allows you to do that, those bugs, uh, when it comes to name clones, are extremely difficult to find because it's valid code in essence. And you have the right code that you already are depending on, which means that you can spend an eternity trying to find out what's wrong with your code. So that is a pain, but it, it, you know, it shows also why namespaces and class names are so important. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So he talks about here structuring and dividing things into smaller parts for a class. Yes, absolutely. Uh, littering the global Yes, absolutely. Uh, I would say that I'm against the idea of having global nom namespace in the in general. Uh, there should be very little use. I mean, even in Python, Python allows you to have global variables. Uh, allows very easily. I'm against this idea. I think global variables are okay. They're fine because they help you avoid having to learn how to do object programming, object-oriented programming. But they are a bad idea. It's just a matter of time until you start messing things up. 
It's fine if you make something small, like uh, you know, a small game or a small application, but the more bigger the things are, if you run into name conflict, oh my God, you are screwed. You are really screwed. It, it may take you to, uh, you have to, may have to look at, into thousands of lines of code to really figure out what's going on. It may take you literally days, if not weeks, to find the, uh, the error. It's, these name conflicts are extremely difficult to find. So that's because it doesn't happen to you very often. Doesn't mean that necessarily uh, it shouldn't be a feature, right? Because some things happen only one time and then you regret it for the rest of your life. Uh... Yeah, it says here, uh, the problem is, uh, is they, they are specifically worried when it comes to plugins because plugins define classes and usually they use class names for convenience. And they say that, you know, you, you have like hundreds of plugins. At some point, some plugin will overwrite uh, an existing name. And that's going to create all, all sorts of uh, havoc inside uh, the Godot. So they propose here a namespace implementation. Um, I mean, I don't understand why they don't have an implementation similar to Python. I mean, Python modules are not really that complex. They're just objects that store names. There's not really a lot of complexity behind the implementation of Python modules. I mean, I'm not saying it's easy to implement it. It's definitely it's going to be a work to implement it, but uh, it's a good design. Yeah, here it shows about loading a script as uh, a, a class variable and going through the the script namespace for loading the other scripts and the other classes they have. Yeah, people keep talking here about workarounds. <laughs> It's, it is a problem. So is there any solution for this? No, nothing. Why this one is closed? Who closed that, first of all? Why it's closed? I appreciate the idea of those namespaces. I come from other lags. Having namespaces, I really wonder if this is possible. Just can you find out it isn't. They said I vote your request. Why this is closed? You know, if I wasn't convinced of using Python, now I'm, <laughs> now I am. It's a very important issue. They don't close that. I mean, namespace is a huge deal for programming languages. I, I don't understand. At least if you close, if you say that, OK, I'm not going to implement namespaces in, in this script, at least say why you don't want to. Maybe because they have a new. No, basically, that's the whole problem with issues, right? You open one issue, you close another one. Is one closed as well? Mm, OK, wait, 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 what's that? So this is a, a person that already had a problem, a name, a name conflict. Here we go. Yeah, and he goes down the the, the rabbit hole of uh, yeah. That's 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 a big that's a big minus for the script. Yeah. So basically, that means that there is no namespace for the script. We are screwed, basically, if we limit. That's another reason for me to stick with Python. OK, that's great. So uh, what I was uh, looking at, uh, I was looking at if there was namespaces. So that means that my strategy of using a prefix, uh, it was a good idea. So because basically the name of the class in the C++ site matters because GDescript uses the same name for the GDescript site. Uh, because obviously I will expose this functionality to GDescript as well. So here I define a voxel, here I define a mess for the voxel. 
Um, okay, so what we need to do now is write the code. So when it comes to class mesh, we have, first of all, the instance variables. So we're going to have to create, first of all, let's take a look at this, how initialization works exactly. Uh, let me think. So the initialization goes, yeah, so we need probably a pointer. Do we need a pointer? Um, so the one thing that the problem I have right now is how I'm going to be referring to data um, from the Python side. Because those examples here, they create the, pi the data on the Python side and they manage the data from the Python. So here basically creates a rectangle, which is an instance of the rectangle class, and stores that inside the Python variable crect. I don't want to do that. I want Python to access the data from the Godot side. So I want Python, to, and the reason why I want to do that because uh, means that Python will not have to synchronize the data with the Godot data. Because now you have data on the Godot side, now you have data on the Python side, and the same data basically and you have to find a way to synchronize them. However, if I make Python force it to always go to Godot to get the data, it's always gonna get the latest data. So, yeah. The big question right now is how the hell I'm gonna do this? That is a design decision I have to think things, things through. So I need to make sure that Python cannot by any means uh, override Godot. If it changes something, that should change on the Godot side. If it reads something, that reads should happen on the Godot side. The data will always have to keep on the Godot side, which basically Godot side is the C++ code itself. Now, I think that is exactly what ZScript is doing anyway. Uh, so the big question is how we're going to do this. Now, there, there are ways to do this. Um, the best way to do this is having a, a singleton class which keeps a track of all its instances. And then you go through the instance, find a specific instance, get a pointer to that instance, and access the data of that instance directly. Uh, that is one way of doing it. I think I'm going to take a break and think about this because this is a bit of a complicated thing. Yeah, I'm going to take a break for 10 minutes and think about it and come back and see how I'm going to do this on this Python site. See you guys in 10 minutes.
Okay, we're back. So, so the wave boxes are working. So right now I have make here uh, the voxels. Uh, the way I defined it is having a voxel, a voxel class, and which has a width height. By the way, I forgot to add also depth because it's a dimensional. So a voxel is basically a cube that defines a volume and inside this volume in thus this area of space we put insert inside a mess we generate depending on geometry we we might into now voxels traditionally are grouped into blocks so there is the the division of a block so the big question right now is how I'm going to map this into the memory of Godot. That is the dilemma here. Uh, one way of doing this is having a block that holds uh, an array of pointers to every voxel instance that belongs to that block. So you have an instance of a block that holds pointers and references every voxel that is made out of it. And in reality, the, only, the easy way to do this is having uh, a block class that takes as data, as input, it has one single variable, which is voxels, and that voxels are an array of instances of uh, the voxel class here. So the way we can do this is like uh, that. Uh, having one that's called class uh, chi uh, voxel block, uh, which is gonna be. Uh, hmm. I could make it so it's an inheriting from. So, can the block be also a voxel by itself? Because the, the voxel has also width, height, depth, but we don't really care so much about its vertices. Do we? Or at this distance value? So no, it's not. It's not really. It's not really a voxel per se. So I'm not gonna make it a voxel per se. I'm gonna make it just a simple object. Uh, GD class. So I'm exposing that as well to GD script. Uh, I'm gonna call this uh, Kai voxel block, and it's gonna inherit it from object. And uh, protect it. I'm gonna expose its methods as well to GDScript. So why this one? So GDScript means static uh, void uh, byte methods. Uh, and It's gonna have uh, then public. Then it also have. It's also gonna have. Yeah, I'm I'm very tempted. I will I will still inherit from voxel yeah, because it's gonna have pretty much the same thing almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna inherit from the voxel, and the reason behind that is because uh, voxel. Uh, sorry, Kai Voxel. Uh, and the reason behind that is because I, it's going to have basically the same exact 
Um, the same exact. Apart from one thing, and that's gonna be. Uh, how you make an array? Kai. Voxel. I think voxels. But maybe do it like that. But you have to define the size of the array, though. Uh, I, I don't know how to do that. So this is going to have the instance of those voxels here. But it's also going to have the same thing, width, height, depth, position of the block, of course, the vertices, the distance value. Well, it's going to have distance values per se, because they're not going to be useful in this case. It, it, it does, it, it's not going to have this mesh, however. The problem, however, with having a mess there is that... Well, you, you do need a mess, though. Yeah. You do need a mess there. Because the only problem with, with that is that uh, uh, storing a mess basically means you replicate the data because now you have the best mess data in the individual voxel because uh, every voxel has its own mess data in essence. Then you have the entire block which captures the area of block. So let's say I, I, have, I have a hand here, right? And there's a block around this area of the hand. So that means the block only captures the tips of my fingertips. That means that specific voxels would take different pieces of those tips of my fingers, uh, you know, right? So now you have the mess that defines this block. We contain the voxels inside. We have only specific pieces. This you have, you have, means that you have the mess data two times, in essence. So the big question, of course, there is how you eliminate that so you don't have to occupy memory without any use. Although it may be also useful to have duplicate memory if you want to manipulate the mess some way on a voxel level. So you don't have to generate the mess data every single time, which is pretty expensive. Uh, you can do something simple like moving... Uh, if you want to move, for example, a block away and take the mess with you, uh, you can do that if you have the entire mess assembly as one thing. So, one thing that, uh, uh, for example, that means that this one is going to inherit a messer, uh, but the messer in the block may go through and collect the mess for every voxel and erase the mess in every voxel. So the mess doesn't exist in the voxel anymore. Uh, of course, there is also another option of not keeping a copy of the mess at all to avoid uh, duplicate data. But yeah, I don't think this is a problem right now. So this uh, block will have the width, the high, height and depth. It's going to have a position, of course. It's going to have vertices, not that useful in this case. Distance values, not useful at all. MS, of course, useful. And a messer, yes, because a messer basically is the one that makes the generation of the mess. And of a constructor, of course. Uh, I'm not sure about this. How you make an array of instances of classes? That I'm not certain about. So... Uh, So, how you make an array of classes? C++ array of instances. Yeah, let's take a look at this. How you make an array of objects? How you define those? So, what is the definition of the array? Okay, so there's the problem, is that I don't really know... I don't really know how many... Um, yeah... Hmm. My class of... Yeah, that's fine, but you have to define... So do I define this as a pointer? Probably have to define this as a pointer. It makes sense. So I have that as 
important to voxels and then can be defined as an array. I'm not sure this is going to work though at all. Because an array has to be of specific size. An array has to be of a specific size. Uh, Omoni, hello there, welcome, welcome. I'm sure there will be a list templates class somewhere in Gorod. Yeah, that is another good question. Is can we use... Uh, just join, I have to go soon, still curious on your progress. Thank you, man, thank you for being here. Uh, yeah, you, 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 you are more welcome to come and go whenever you please. Uh, yeah, that's a very good uh, uh, point there, is that uh, I'm already using um, uh, uh, grow types. For example, the vector3 I'm using is uh, the vector3 you see here and the vector template is of uh, Godot type. I've taken this from Godot, which is taken from inside the vector3 math, which is part of the core folder of Godot source code. So that is using an FD, which is very important because that means that this is something that also GDescript can have access to. That's one of the reasons that I also use because I want to make my script API accessible from GDescript and from Python at the same time. So you can make a list of things. For example, here we have a list of uh, vector threes. We have a list of vec floats. Uh, so it's possible to make a list of things. Of course, the big question here is what happens if I do this? What happens if I make a vector out of objects? So I say vector chi voxel voxels. So that means it's going to use the vector class, which I'm fine with, because I, I like the idea that it's going to behave like a vector. So it's going to have like a, a pushback function, a size function, and all this kind of stuff. So I don't know if this is going to work. This is going to use... Uh, what is it? What was it? I think I closed it. So this one is going to use this one here, which, by the way... Why why, why, why opens uh, in line? Go definition. Oh, come on. Go definition. Go. Thank you. So this is basically what defined by Godot. It's a class called Vector. It's a template class. And it has some nice functions inside, which is basically why I'm using it. It has the iterators. It has also, what the hell is that? No, this is a list H. Wait, what? Wait, there's a Vector H and there's a list H. Wait, what? There are two Vector classes? How is this possible? Whoa, 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 whoa. No, this is crap. No, oh, no, 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 no. I think it got confused. No, this is from another library. No, 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 no. Don't want that. Yeah, yeah, my bad. Uh, okay, let's find it. If I find it here. What was it? Why didn't I didn't find it? Yeah, it's, it's confused. It is confused. What is it? No, nah, that's, that's different. Oh, no, no, no. What was it? Uh, okay, so I'm gonna go to the header file then. Uh, vector3, got definition. Here's the vector3, but what is the vector class though? Uh, what was it? Vector, 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 vector. Come on. Okay, I'm gonna find it here. So, vector, blah, blah. So, oh, okay, we have even a string. Okay, if I go here and go definition, here we go. Yeah, this is it. So this is the class of Godot, which is called Vector. And we can see that you can use it for a string, for a Vector2, for an int, for a point. So the big question I ask myself is why not do the same with my class, which is a voxel? Why, not, why cannot have a vector of voxels? A vector, basically, for those who don't know, it's an array. It's nothing more than an array. It's a list, basically. Uh, so I think I'm going to do it like that. Uh, is a list cumbersome but still possibility. However, vector sounds better. I never try vector. Yeah, vector is basically a, a Godot implementation here. And one of the reasons why I'm using vector is because, again, it is accessible from, from GDescript. And it has the things I need. It has the append function, which is what you need from a list. It has a remove at, it has an erase. 
Uh, it has a pointer if I want to create a pointer. Uh, it can check whether it's empty. It can clear the list itself. It can get a specific index. Uh, it can set a specific index. It gets a size. Uh, it has an operator, which can be accessed like an array, which means you, you basically access like a typical array. And it has a hash function, which says whether you has a value or not, which is very important if you want to check whether Voxel exists in that array or not. Uh, yeah. And it has... So I don't know some of the functions there and it may not work because it may expect something that has primitive types or it may expect something that has... But then, of course, if you have a vector of a vector of uh, strings, like we had here, so we have a vector of strings here, right? A vector of strings... What is it? Wait, well, I found it early on. It was a vector of strings. Ah, it's a capital string. Okay, so a vector of string... So a vector of string... By the way, here it is. This one also is not uh, a C++ type. This is a Godot type that can be found in variant, I think. Oh, it's in uString. So it can be found in uString. This is also defined in Godot, uh, which is a Unicode string, uh, because I think C++ doesn't support Unicodes out of the box. Uh, so again, we try here to use as much of Godot uh, types as possible to make things as native to Godot as possible. So, yeah, I think this is going to work. I think this should work. Uh, that's why I stuck with C++. Every program defines its own list and hash maps. In Unreal, they have their own resolution as well. Yeah. That's why it sucks. C++ sucks. <laughs> because the types and the implementation of the language and the features of the language are so lame that people have to define their own types every single time. And, and this is actually standard types. They're, they're nothing crazy about it. it's a string type for example right? you don't expect strings to do crazy amount of things right I mean, okay with strings you couldn't expect because you have regex and you have all the kind of stuff but what you can expect from a vector 2 for example right it's a simple vector 2 it just you know takes two two dimensional values um, usually you get those things for free uh, now you're not, you're not gonna get vectors in for free uh, two-dimensional vectors for free in a language because usually that's a graphics oriented it but it's it's standard types right it's, it shouldn't be you shouldn't have to define your own. Anyway, uh, the, the point is that Godot here has its own types and they do just fine work. And since I want to keep things as much inside Godot as possible, I'm going to be using this type. So I'm happy with that. I think this should work. I think this one's going to create a list, basically, uh, which is going to behave uh, like the vector class. And it's going to take a kind of voxel instances inside and going to keep those instances. Which means we can do the same thing with uh, a voxel world. So we can make another container. Hmm? Mm, do we need another container though? I mean, if you think about it, uh, we can use a block to capture other blocks. So instead of here having a chi voxel, well, yeah, we do have to do that because here we define a chi voxel as a way. So I'm going to define, oh, let's define another thing, which is going to be copy paste this. And I'm going to define one that's going to be called Kai. The one, the another thing I wonder was wondering if you are considering doing if actually using the node class. So instead of inheriting from my own classes only, I could also inherit from the node class and have this been an actual native node inside Godot, which I act like I could insert inside the editor. So I have the editor inserting blocks, etc. The reason why I don't really care for making this as a, as, an, as a node inside the editor is because generally you can have thousands of voxels and to make things work, usually voxels are temporary. When you make a terrain, for example, and you voxelize the terrain, you're going to throw away the voxels because the, the, the moment that the player starts moving, it's going to generate more terrain and it's going to throw away the existing one. Right? So if it moves away, because it moves, of course, the area of visibility, it, it, it rejects some of the messages that create it. It doesn't keep anything in memory because terrain is infinite and it's a massive amount of data. So it, it doesn't keep the data around. It's not like a static mess or a dynamic mess that is like an enemy that you're going to keep it around because you want to make a mess instance and all this kind of stuff. With the terrain, you don't really do this kind of things, which means terrains are extremely disposable and they are disposed all the time. Uh, you generally don't want to keep the memory because you can fill up the memory very fast like that. So I don't think it makes much of a sense to make this everything as a node. 
uh, because then I have to delete nodes and, and create nodes all the time. It's going to be pretty expensive. So, of course, then you can say to yourself, what if I don't create new voxels and I just move those voxels together with the player? Because every single time, you know, the voxels will calculate their distance from the procedural geometry. So you can say that the voxels don't really change in size. I don't, what I throw away is only their data, the mesh data, because I'm generating different mesh data every single time. So that, that requires a bit of a statistical thinking there, is how you make the voxels work together with the mesh generation. Because a voxel is two things. It's an area that occupies, but also contains inside a mesh that generates, uh, depending on the 3D geometry that it, it maps to. Uh, so that I haven't, I haven't really decided about that yet. Uh, well, to solve the container question, it's important to decide how this data shall be accessed. The list is basically greater for fast inserts. Nothing more. Yeah, a list is faster than a dictionary. But is it? Wait, 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 wait. I think in Python, if I'm not mistaken, dictionaries actually are faster. Because they are randomly accessed, if I'm not mistaken. I think dictionaries are actually faster because of the, the hashing they're doing. They are not faster to create. They, they, they are more... Uh, slower to create because they, you have to create the, the, the you have to do the hash and all this kind of stuff. So it takes some performance there when you uh, create a new entry. But because they do, they're not continuous, like uh, a list is continuous, goes from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you have to make sure that you don't have gap, gaps inside your list. Uh, Dixon, on the other hand, is not continuous because it works on keys, right? So I think accessing a dictionary is actually faster than accessing a list. Creating a list is actually faster than creating a dictionary, though. Or uh, modifying uh, a list is faster than modifying a dictionary. So yeah, that's that's. In the end of the day, it doesn't really matter, and it doesn't really matter for me because uh, I'm thinking and considering of uh, moving all this to the GPU. So it's a good uh, it's a good uh, strategy to move this into compute shaders. Uh, this is another reason why I'm using Python, because Python allows you to write compute shaders in Vulkan and in CUDA. So, yeah, that's another reason why I'm using Python and I'm thinking Python, because it will allow me to move to CUDA and I don't have to wait uh, two to three years for the Go developers to give us access to... We don't have... We, we, right now we have access to Vulkan fragment and vertex shaders, but we don't have access to the compute shaders, which is a new thing that Vulkan really brought to the table. So, yeah, uh, that's another reason to use Python. Uh, link lists for inserts for lookup sticks are better, of course. Link list. Oh, link list is a different thing. Uh, yeah. yeah, I have used a link list uh, in, in when I was working in Blender. Uh, pretty nice, pretty fine. Well, HashMap usually do not preserve order forever. Last Python relation changed that as far as I've... Yeah, I think Python, they did... They did do something with the order. It used to be uh, the dictionaries used to be unordered, and I think now they're ordered or something like that. Python shaders, never heard of that. Uh, yeah, Python shaders. Uh, you can use Python to write shaders. It's uh, there's a, a module that is used that's called PySader. PySaders, I think. And there's of course PyCuda, etc., etc. Right. So Python is everywhere. PySaders, I think it's called. Yeah. Pythonic OpenGL Sader Rubber. I don't know if it uses Python syntax to make the shaders or it just uses Python to access the shaders. Uh, let's see if we find an example. Uh... No, I think probably the, it, it still is a shader, uh, it still uses the shader language. But it allows you to use Python to basically load and unload the shader and compile them, etc. Which is fine. I don't, I don't mind using the shader language because usually the shader language is going to be faster than Python because you don't want to use a Python language because, you know, shaders are, are statically typed, which is a lot faster for them. So it makes little sense to write them in complete Python. But I don't want to use Python to load and unload them because initializing Vulkan and, and doing anything in Vulkan is very tedious and very time-consuming. So yeah, there Python can help with that. 
uh, shader language itself. The shader language compute shader is very similar to the uh, GLSL language and already have done work with uh, shaders in Godot, so I do know the language a bit. So I don't have a problem with that. Yeah, Pi shaders, uh, you just open a new world for me, thanks. Yeah, Pi shaders is basically similar to how we have Godot shaders inside uh, Godot, right? So you have GDescript and you can load in a lot of shaders, you can access the uniforms through GDescript, right? So you can do the same thing with Python here. The only difference is that uh, the Py shaders here don't limit you only to fragment and vertex shaders, they also can take advantage of compute shaders. And compute shaders are extremely rise, extremely cool because they allow you much more flexibility in the kind of data you can pass arrays, you can pass buffers, you can pass you know this multi-dimensional arrays and uh, structs, and I think even objects. I think to, to some extent, I don't think. And, and that's the kind of flexibility you're not going to have in a fragment shader and a, and a vertex shader. And compute shaders are used more for general purpose. And actually, this is algorithm I'm using, which is called matching cubes, because it goes through every single voxel and makes a mess for the voxel, a, a part of the mess that maps to that voxel, uh, that actually maps extremely well for shaders, because shaders go from pixel to pixel, right? But in, instead of here having a two-dimensional thing, where you have shader running an instance for every pixel, you have 3D pixels, right? So you have basically the voxel become a big pixel, right? So you have also a third dimension there, which means that you, you, you run your shader you can learn because uh, i think the way that shaders run are still two-dimensional even when you do compute shaders and then you just run it again for the next dimension the next dimension the next dimension the next dimension. so you increment and you do like a for loop for uh, the z-axis for example so that means that you can you know you can have a, a massive acceleration for what i've seen you can get acceleration up to 30 times faster which is pretty good it's really good but we'll see we'll see we'll see I tried HCL cell compute shaders in Unity, but never tried beyond that. HCL cell, yeah, HCL cell is, I think HCL cell is also compute shaders, yeah. Dave Rinoy, hello, welcome. Welcome, welcome. Yeah, um, try HCL cell compute shaders in Unity, but never tried beyond that, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the nice thing about. Uh, uh, Python here is that you can do that and uh, as a matter of you, you don't even need to embed Python uh, into Godot. You can run Python as a script and just uh, have it com com computate, uh, uh, have it computate the, all the things in uh, because usually in a few seconds end up that uh, uh, directly to the memory of Godot then like a file import the uh, load the file the script file in this, uh, the match file to my memory if you want to. But of course, in this case, I, I want to do this real time, uh, which becomes a lot trickier. Dave Rinoy says, 4.0 is going to have a nice compute shader API from what I understand. Really? I never heard anyone talking about the compute API. Really? Okay, now you have my interest. Now you have definitely my interest. Uh, let's take a look at this. Uh, Godot for compute shaders. Really? Never heard anything about that. Dave is perfect. Dave is perfect. Dave is, Dave is good. Dave is nice. So where's the compute shader? Uh, what is that? No, that's not a compute shader. He's using a fragment shader, I think, here. Why call it a compute shader? I don't know. That's not a compute shader. Uh, just to rebuild the last version of version. Uh,
Well, the, w a computer center doesn't use a rendering device. That's the whole point of the computer center. Computer center runs on... Uh, it completely is disconnected with a graphics API at all. A computer center is not graphics related. You can run any, co any form of code you want. You can run physics simulations, you can run your database, you can run all sorts of crazy stuff. AI uh, libraries usually run on computer centers, for example, artificial intelligence. Uh, so it's not really related to rendering. Uh, so I don't see how it works with God of War. Uh, if you have any link, please provide it. Wait, 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 wait. There's something from Juan. Juan says... Uh, it's not possible to create your own rendering device to use rendering or compute in your game thread. Whoa, 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 it, whoa. It's basically what you were saying, the rendering device. Uh, yeah, but how you access and you compile uh, compile uh, centers. This rendering device cannot draw in the scene nor share that with other ones used for rendering. They're mostly meant so you can take advantage of the GPU for complex game logic. Very useful uh, for complex game logic, which means what? The problem, however, is that we, we have to have an API for loading and compiling the center as well. And that is not, uh, I don't see that here. Uh, rather, they give access to a rendering device that can be used for computing, which is fine, but you still have to compile the shader and load it to the rendering device. So that's... I think that what they did here is most likely they give you an access uh, on AI Pi level. Uh, but from what I've seen here, this one is actually GDescript. So they use RD to do all local drawing, compute, or send on any thread you want. Yeah, but you have to be a bit more specific here. Uh, oh yeah, I'm not touching it. There is no an nice API. I'm not good at programming. Yeah, I don't think there is a, uh, an API for compute shaders. That's uh, that's more look like like a workaround, like a, give you access to the rendering devices. But you still, how, how the hell are you going to do the compilation of the shader from GDescript? I mean, how are you going to... You have to compile the shader, and then you have to load the shader into the memory of Volpo. How are you going to do that? It just creates a local device. Okay, well, that's great, but how am I going to use this? I mean, to, to, the, to, to put it in an idea, uh, Godot, for example, has its own shader language. It doesn't even give you access to GLSL. Godot has its own shader language that is incompatible with GLSL. It's very different with GLSL, uh, which is the standard language for uh, compute shaders. Uh, compute shaders are also GLSL, and fragment shaders and uh, vertex shaders. So it doesn't even give you access to that part. Which means that in order to have compute shaders in this script, you will have to, as a Go developer, invent also a shader language for compute shaders. Because already Go invents a language for fragment shader, it invents a different language for vertex shaders. Now they have to invent also a language for compute shaders for this to work. It's not enough just to allow you to compile shaders and you know, load them and unload them. It, they will have to provide you with a language with that because there's no way that you can light, uh, load GLSL directly inside Godot. You cannot do that. You have to go and convert your GLSL code to the shader language of Godot. Um, I think, uh, uh, I'm think I'm, 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 uh, they are fixing that in 4.0 as well, making it more GLSL compatible. Okay, okay, that's fine with that. Uh, actually, they have fixed that. They, I'm using God of War, and, and God of War has, for example, structs, which it didn't have in God of 3. And it has oh, the most important thing of all, because a huge pain, was having arrays. So already God of War center language is much better than the God of 3 center language. But it still is a center language, right? It still is not GLSL. Uh, they don't allow you, for example, to include files from another file. So a typical include you're going to do in the GLSL if you have common functions. Uh, I would love if GDescript have a way to just dump it and use it standard GLSL shaders. I don't know why they don't offer this. It's it's a no-brainer, uh, and it should be difficult to implement for them. Uh, 
just to allow you to, to directly load GLSL shaders because you have a shader you find online, right? You, you don't want to go through and just convert stuff. And there is no big advantage from using the uh, the shader language of Godot, right? It's still it's almost the same as GLSL. Uh, most of the things that will be a pain to do in GLSL are also a pain to do in the Godot shader language. It's a bit more simplified and fine-tuned for Godot. That's all about it. Uh, that thread on GitHub about compute devices give me motivation to check Godot again. I switched to Unity thanks to the ECS dots to create sandbox games. Yeah. ECS dots. This is basically some kind of uh, data management system they have in, uh, in Unity. I'm not a fan of entity component systems. Uh, I'm not a fan of entity systems, generally. The idea of stuffing everything into a dictionary because this one is technically, I tend to be less more flexible, and especially in languages like C-Sharp, they tend to be much more flexible than dynamic objects you find in dynamic languages. But also they tend to be more performant. I think one of the reasons why people go with the CS is because it's more performant. But on the other hand, if performance is your, your, your problem, you shouldn't be doing that on the CPU anyway. You should be doing these things on the GPU. Uh, if you do something that uh, has a lot of data and has uh, a lot of computation, have to do on the, that. Anyway, it's of course you know everybody wants to work differently. Um, it's I, I, I was wrong. It's on the 4.1 pipeline. Oh, <laughs> we are far away from 4.1 right now. Wait, it's where you see it. It's in the 4.1. If you have any information about it, you can share a link. I, I do allow links in my stream. I'm definitely interested to in find out uh, what exactly happens there. Uh, I would love compute shaders will make my fluid shimmer so much better. Yeah, absolutely. Compute shaders are, can be used for anything, yeah. Uh, they are very flexible and a lot faster. But they are also a lot more difficult to code in. And debugging them is a pain. It's a huge pain. So I'm not recommending people to use compute shaders unless you really, really need a big performance. But it's a huge performance boost, right? You, from what I've seen, you can get easily 10 times and 30 times faster speeds on a compute shader you can get on, even in C++. Even in C++, it's, it's kind of crazy. What? Well, in Unity, dots equals fast picture as well. Fax picture? What do you mean by fax picture? Like instances in faster render. Wait, dots in, in Unity are uh, coded in uh, C++, right? They are in C++ implementation. I don't think they run on the GPU. If I remember correctly, I don't know much about the DOTS system. I know that it's heavily popular because it uh, accelerates uh, having to deal with a lot of data. Uh, but I think it runs on the C++. It runs on the CPU side. It doesn't, doesn't run on the GPU. I don't know. So anyway, we fixed that as well. Uh, so now I'm instances in the voxels as well here. Uh, ECS dots runs on in C sharp. No, it doesn't run on C sharp uh, because uh, C sharp is much slower than C plus plus. Unity is coded in C plus plus. Unity is coded in the same language that Godot is coded in C plus plus, and of course Unreal. Uh, the C sharp part of it is only for you for you guys to access it. So you can access it from C sharp, but most likely it's coded in C plus plus. The big question I have I have right now is: Is it also it's uh, running on on, a, on, a, on, a, on the GPU, which means in order to run on GPU, it has to be coded as a collection of shaders. Uh, if it's all, also GPU accelerated, that would be great. Uh, so it's for multi-core CPU. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm, if it's coded in C++, it's called it using threads, yeah. I don't know. I haven't really tested. I don't know how fast it is. But I, I, from what I've seen, I don't think it's run on GPU because if, it, if they make it run on the GPU, it's going to be much more limited. In what it what we able it will be faster a lot faster but it's also going to be a lot limited in what can do still they made the geometry instancing and other graphic speeds so called what still they made geometry instances and other graphical speeds with so called hybrid renderer what is a hybrid renderer ah uh, you mean hybrid renderers usually we call renderers that run on the CPU and the GPU at the same time if you if you mean that something like that. Additionally, GLSL said there's not going to say there's a real GLSL for Vulkan extension can now be imported. It can be edited in the engine. 
that's fine. But suppose Seder. Yes. Nice. Nice. Thank you very much, Dave. Now that now that is big news. That is that is massive news. What was that? Why I missed that? Oh, whoa! It's a long time ago. Okay. 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 Let's take a look at this. So. Sando bias. What was that? Okay, let's take a look at this. Uh, DLSL. Control find DLSL. Ah, okay, here it is. Uh, low level access to the rendering device. Ah, okay, here it is. Gold 4 will allow you to have low level access to the rendering APIs, allowing you to do all the same things Gold does with doing rendering or calling your custom code in the middle of render passes. Additional DLSL shaders, not Gold shaders, uh, can, be, can now be imported. Okay, what is the documentation for that? Can now be imported. It, it can be edited in the engine, which is fine. It means basically what it means by it cannot be edited in the engine is that they uh, they cannot be edited anyway in the engine because the engine only supports the shader language, uh, which is different from GLSL. So you cannot even edit the GLSL shaders anyway. Even uh, I don't know if they, if they plan to do also a shader language for compute shaders, but support shader variants using a custom syntax. Oh wait, what? Ah, so they have a shader variant. Wait, what kind of shaders though? So wait, if they have a custom syntax for the shaders, that already applies for 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 Vogodo. It has a shader language with custom syntax. But is the custom syntax extended for computer shaders as well? It doesn't really mess on computer shaders here. They will be automatically important convert to spear fee for one when found with your proper reports on import errors. So... Uh, I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't really talk about compute shaders here. So that is remains to be seen. There may be, there may be ways to do it. I think from the looks of it, it may be possible to load compute shaders using standard GLSL syntax. We'll see. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the client system code is coded in C sharp and compiled with burst compiler. Okay. The client system code is coded in C sharp. I don't know. Maybe? Uh, yeah, it's a while ago, haha. <laughs> but I knew I remember reading that somewhere. Uh, Habit rendering is just the official name for Unity package. Happy render is not a render problem. It is a system that collects the data necessary for editing ECSA entities and sends this to your data unity existing in the rendering media architecture. So hybrid standards for ECS, no ECS. Ah, okay, okay. It has nothing to do with graphics. It's the way that uh, uh, it's, yeah, Unity stores data inside. Uh, yeah, but it's supporting proper GL cell. You can just offload your computer into... Uh, does it support uh, proper GL cell? Here it says that... Uh, Additional GL shaders can now be imported. It can be edited, but support shader variants using custom syntax. That I don't understand. So is it GL cell with custom syntax? I, 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 frankly, I don't find this very clear. We have to take a look and see. For now, I haven't seen anything here that convinces me that this is actually compute shader friendly. Okay, I have to go down. Thanks for the stream and links. Good luck with the streams. Thanks, man. I'm actually go going to uh, end the stream as well. Uh, I'm kind of hungry, so I'm going to go grab something to eat. Or maybe not. I'm not an expert. Yeah, well, we'll see. We'll see. For now, uh, that's not really my concern. I, know I don't plan to, to run the code on the GPU just yet. It's much down the line. And probably I will... Uh, although, you know, I don't have a problem doing it through Python. Uh, I don't think there's going to be any advantage of doing it from, through Godot. Because uh, compute shaders run on their own kind of... Uh, th compute shaders usually, usually do their own thing. So there is no advantage of having them from inside Godot, per se. Uh, because they are standalone shaders that just run on the GPU directly, and then you get the data. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see how this is going to work. So let me end the stream here uh, for now. Uh, because I will have to take a break and go and break up something to eat. So let's see who is streaming Godot right now. Uh, Godot engine. 
Oh, I am the only one that's doing Godot? Okay. Uh, no one else is doing anything? Okay, so let's go with the expansions. Okay. So it seems that I'm only the only one that's doing Godot right now. Um, yeah, let's go for Dev Spansions. I really like his stream. So thanks, guys, for being here. Uh, thanks for uh, coming to the stream. Uh, we'll take a, uh, a break for now. I don't know if I'm coming back, back later on. We'll see. I will come back with another stream. Probably I will do a stream on modeling. Uh, do some modeling. I'm not in the mood of doing more coding. And we'll see what happens when it happens. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Uh, see you again in the next stream. Bye-bye.